presentation is data interoperability via persistent identifiers, libraries leading the way, and will be presented by Sheila Rabin. Sheila? Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session on interoperability with persistent identifiers or PIDs. My name is Sheila Rabin, and I am the program leader for persistent identifier communities at Lyricist. So for this talk, I'm going to be focused on ORCID and DOIs, specifically the ORCID API and the Datacite API. So I'm fairly confident that interoperability is a shared goal among academic libraries. Um, so the goal is to have system interoperability, data interoperability. We're trying to get away from silos or cylinders of excellence, um, as my colleague Lauren DeMont at University of Rochester calls them. But in order to have interoperability, we need to have specifications or standards that everyone can follow. So persistent identifiers like ORCID and DOIs are standards that enable interoperability and contribute to increased trust and efficiency in the research and scholarly ecosystem. Persistent identifiers also contribute to open research infrastructure by supporting fair data principles, making research data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I know that many people are already familiar with ORCID and DOIs, but just in case anyone is new to persistent identifiers, or maybe you don't think about them every day like I do, here's a quick refresher. So ORCID allows for interoperability of data about people and their affiliations and contributions. ORCID stands for Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier, and ORCID IDs are unique persistent identifiers for people to help with name disambiguation. So anyone can get an ORCID ID for free and um, the ORCID organization is a nonprofit community-driven uh, organization that manages the ORCID registry with support from organizational members across the globe. So ORCID IDs link to ORCID records, which serve as an interoperable hub of information metadata about individual researchers and their affiliations and activities. So as long as individuals continue to keep their information in their ORCID record up to date and continue to use ORCID IDs to identify themselves, we can use ORCID to distinguish between individuals regardless of any changes in names or any other changes over time. Um, DOIs allow for interoperability of metadata about things. So in many cases, the, these are things like publications and various research objects and scholarship. DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier, and the object that a DOI identifies does not have to be digital, but the identifier is digital. And it's hosted at doi.org and points to a landing page that contains information about the object and ideally a way to access that object. So what you're seeing here is an example of a DOI for a slide deck presentation in Zenodo. So there's a URL that points to, um, that the DOI points to. And there are a few different DOI registration agencies, but the most common, at least in the US, are Crossref and Datacite. And so organizations can become members of Crossref and Datacite in order to assign DOIs to your own local content. Um, and so as long as the metadata for each object is kept up to date, the object can always be found through its DOI. And there are many different persistent identifiers out there. Um, for example, the Research Organization Registry or ROAR is a new, newish open standard for identifying organizations. Um, but for example, with ORCID and DOIs and all of the other persistent identifiers that are out there, we do have the ability to include PIDs in the metadata of other PIDs. So for example, like you're seeing here, ORCID IDs can be included in DOI metadata and DOIs can be included in ORCID metadata. And everything is then linked together in a human and machine readable ecosystem of interoperable data about our individual and collective research activities. 
which brings me to the idea of the PID graph, which is a um, kind of newish trend in the PID landscape. Um, so the example that I'm sharing here is from my colleague in Australia, Melroy Almeida. And this is what's called a PID graph. And basically, this was shared at the Pitapalooza conference in January of this year. And what you're seeing here is a data visualization that shows the research organizations who are working on coronavirus research in December of 2009. There were roughly 1,500 research organizations involved, and the visualization is highlighting contributions from the United States and Great Britain. And if we fast forward 10 years in December of 2019, we're seeing that there are just over 3,000 research organizations involved. And this time we're seeing highlights from China, Brazil, and Spain, for example. And then more recently, as of December 2020, which was just a few months ago, this number of organizations has grown exponentially. There are over 46,000 organizations involved, as you can see. And through this, organ, uh, through this visualization, we can zoom in and we can actually see the specific organizations that are involved, um, who is participating, who is collaborating, how many publications have come out, how their research was funded. And we can get this information thanks to persistent identifiers. In this specific case, the data here is coming from ORCID and DOIs. Um, and so this, this visualization is somewhat of an extreme example, but the idea is that libraries can use persistent identifiers to more efficiently um, and accurately gather information about um, research activity. So tracking faculty publications, tracking use of resources in an institutional repository or open educational resources, for example. Um, and working with research data and data management plans, for example. So backing up now um, to the ORCID and data site APIs um, and how we can work with them. So for ORCID, anyone can access the ORCID public API. You just have to have your own ORCID ID and be logged into your ORCID record and go to the developer tools tab. Um, and the ORCID public API allows us to do four things. We can use the public API to search the ORCID registry for public data and search for people and their affiliated information. We can also allow individuals to log in to an application using their ORCID cred credentials. Um, just like you would see options to log in with Facebook or Gmail, ORCID is a trusted um, way to allow people to log in. Um, we can use the public API to get researchers authenticated IDs. And this is important because um, when we're trying to identify which ORCID ID belongs to what person, there's a lot of room for error there with manual entry of a 16 digit number. Um, and also because of the fact that multiple people can have the same name or a person's name could change over time. Um, basically, ORCID uses the OAuth process to allow um, an application to collect individuals' ORCID IDs in an authenticated manner. Um, and it's basically where the individual logs into their ORCID record and then they're presented with an authorization screen like you're seeing here. Um, authorizing access for a system or an institution to get your authenticated ORCID ID. And then that ORCID ID number is passed to the local system through the API rather than a manual entry. And finally, the public API allows us to read or import any public data from somebody's ORCID record into a local system. So basically, individuals have full control over the visibility of their data in ORCID, um, and they can choose to set their information to public, private, or trusted parties only. So basically, any information that is sent to the everyone or public setting can be read using the public API. And when I talk about information from within an ORCID record, I'm talking about biographical information, employment history, education history, um, funding that somebody's received, works that somebody has contributed to, 
all of these kinds of things that you might expect to see on like a CV or a resume, for example. Now ORCID does have a member API as well. And through the member API, you can read, uh, you can ask for permission during that OAuth process to read data that's set to trusted parties only, as well as that everyone setting. And users can also authorize permission during the OAuth process to allow an organization or a system to add information to their ORCID record for them. And this data transfer is done through either XML or JSON. So the ORCID member API allows for that two-way flow of data between ORCID and organizational systems. Um, and by using the ORCID member API to add data to somebody's ORCID record, the source of those entries will appear as the name of the organization, which lends more authority and credibility to the assertion. And what you're seeing here is just a few examples of member institutions that have written data to somebody's ORCID record. Um, and so you're seeing that source. And just a side note, the premium member API also allows for webhooks notifications. So you can basically receive an alert anytime information has been updated on somebody's ORCID record. And there are several systems that already have the ORCID API built in, either just using the public functionality or with the ability for member organizations to turn on their member functionality for reading and writing. And some of the common examples are systems that you're seeing here, Pure, Faculty 180, Digital Measures, these kinds of research information systems. Um, InfoEd, Esploro is a new one for repositories. And for open source systems, for example, there's a plugin for OJS um, that's really easy to uh, turn on. Vivo, for example, has an API connection that can be configured. Um, and so basically the ease of integrating with the ORCID API really just depends on what specific systems you're using and the resources that are available to you to do customization. Many libraries are, um, they're also creating custom ORCID API integrations and applications and microservices. And there are so many examples I don't really have time to go into today, but um, just a handful of those examples are listed here. And so I encourage you to go check those out. All right, now for DOIs. The basic thing to remember is that every DOI represents an object and is connected to metadata about that object, which is a bit more straightforward because we don't have to rely on individuals to do authentication. Um, and so Datasite has a REST API and there's again a public and a member API. So the public API allows us to retrieve, query, and browse the metadata that is available in existing DOIs. Um, results are returned in JSON, so they can be easily parsed and used for a variety of purposes. Um, and again, just highlighting here in the XML that we're seeing an ORCID ID and a ROAR ID included in this DOI metadata. So the more we can include persistent identifiers in persistent identifier metadata, the more everything can be connected. The member API allows for automated creation of DOIs within local systems and affiliated metadata. And uh, members can also use the member API to manage their repositories and their DOI prefixes. So Datasite also has a number of certified service providers, including those that you see here that have capabilities for automated creation of DOIs using the member API. And again, the ability to use the data site API will depend on what specific systems you're using. So for vendor systems, they do need to have the API built in. And for custom or open source systems, you basically just need a developer who can you know, set up the configuration. So the effort will vary. Um, it, it really just depends on what systems you're using. So if you want to get yourself and your library involved in using PIDs, there are some actions you can take right now, including one, getting your own ORCID ID if you don't already have one. If you do have an ORCID ID, you might go log in and make sure that it's up to date. 
I've been using mine um, as basically my main record for keeping track of everything that I'm doing. So I don't even have a Word doc resume anymore. I just use my ORCID ID. Um, also, your organization can become a member of ORCID or a member of DataCite or Crossref if you want to use these member APIs in your, in your local systems. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about these and other types of persistent identifiers, I would encourage you to join the PID forum, uh, which is a global communication channel for all things related to persistent identifiers, and look into um, Pitapalooza, which is a conference, an annual conference that is solely dedicated to persistent identifiers. And if your organization is interested in going that membership route for ORCID or DataCite, for example, we do have consortial community groups administered by Lyricist through which any nonprofit organization can join and become a member of either ORCID or a consortial data site member. So basically the ORCID US community was formed a couple of years ago in 2018 as a partnership between Lyricist, the Greater Western Library Alliance, the Northeast Research Libraries, and the Big Ten Academic Alliance. Um, but of course, you don't have to be a member of any of those groups to join. Um, and some of the benefits just include cost sharing, dedicated support, and being part of a community of practice around ORCID. And we have just over 140 member organizations right now. Um, so it's going strong. And then for the data site consortium, this was just formed this year. So we're just getting started. And again, the same benefits apply in terms of membership, cost sharing, dedicated support, and participation in a community of practice, which is already in existence. Um, I know there are a lot of libraries that have already been involved with data site and Crossref and DOIs. So if you want to get involved too, um, let me know. Um, any nonprofit organization can join either of these groups. You don't have to be a member of Lyricist or one of the other consortia. Um, so if you do have any questions or if you have ideas about using the APIs, I'd love to hear from you. Um, thank you so much for attending and have a great day. There it is. Hello. Thank you so much, Sheila. That was an awesome presentation. I think we have time for uh, a couple of questions. Ben is asking, did ORCID at some point change course from add just enough info to your record to identify you to let ORCID be your full CV? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh the full history of what course ORCID has been on, but basically the identifier itself is, is very helpful just for name disambiguation purposes. Um, but, you know, it's helpful to at least have a little bit of information in your ORCID record. But I do want to clarify that ORCID is not a CV. They are not trying to be a CV. It's really just a record where researchers and contributors can store all of your information um, that organizations that you're working with might be asking for. And to have that be an interoperable hub for storing that type of information. So for example, um, researchers that are applying for grant funding from the National um, Institutes of Health, NIH, or National Science Foundation, NSF, they have to create a bio sketch that has like their employment, their education, works, funding, all this stuff. Um, and so there's a tool called Science CV that NIH and NSF allow people to use that is integrated with ORCID. So rather than having to sit there and retype all of that information into different systems and applications, the idea is that organizations can use the ORCID API to just allow somebody to click a button and transfer that data. So you can transfer your information from your ORCID record into Science CV by just clicking a button rather than sitting there and typing it all in. So it's more about, I mean, the, the name disambiguation is one thing, but this kind of CV idea is less about having your ORCID record be a CV and more about that interoperability function. And the science CV is just one example. 
Sheila, thank you so much. There are still a couple other questions in the Q&A. Uh, feel free to go ahead and answer. And we're going to be staying in this virtual meeting room for the next talk. Uh, but please be sure to transition to the next session in Whova to participate in the chat and Q&A. If you're joining in Whova, you'll need to reselect join in Whova in the next session listing. This session's being recorded and will be available at a later date on Code for Lib YouTube channel. Our next presentation is Mapping Metadata, Cleaning and Controlling Fields to Improve Migrations, presented by Paige Morfitt and David Wilcox. Paige is the Digital Assets and Metadata Librarian for Whitman College, and David is the Program Leader for Fedora at Lyricis. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Wilcox. I'm the uh, program leader for Fedora at Lyricis, uh, and I'm joined here by Paige Morfitt, who is the digital assets and metadata librarian at uh, Whitman College. And uh, this presentation is just talking about uh, metadata mapping and remediation efforts uh, in the context of a grant that we've been working on uh, since around September. So I'm going to provide some initial context uh, about the grant work, uh, and then I'm going to hand things over to Paige to uh, go into the details uh, about these efforts. So uh, this project started in September. Uh, it's been funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The grant is the uh, Fedora Migration Paths and Tools pilot project, uh, about $250,000 over 18 months. And the focus here really is trying to help the community move forward from version three of Fedora, which is outdated, uh, to version six, which is the uh, latest release of the software. And really, we're just trying to address uh, what we saw as a major challenge in the community. So most Fedora installations are running unsupported versions of the software, uh, as I said, version three or potentially even earlier versions. And over time, the content in these legacy systems becomes more and more at risk. So as the system gets more out of date and there's no security fixes or patches or anything like that, uh, there's a, a risk of failure. And if the system fails, then all of that content gets potentially lost. So we're really trying to avoid that. Uh, but also recognizing that migrations take a lot of time and effort, which is part of the reason why most of the community hasn't been able to uh, move forward yet. And so the goal overall here is to bring the community forward to a modern and supported version of Fedora, uh, again, to really protect all of that uh, content that's in these legacy systems. So the grant's broken into three phases and we're in the first phase now, which runs until roughly May, and uh, in this phase, we are working with pilot uh, institutions and uh, helping to upgrade and migrate their installations and documenting that whole process. Uh, and we're also detailing the metadata mapping and decision making that's going on here as well, and putting all this information into a, a toolkit, which we intend to uh, share with the community. So we're working with two pilot partners. One is the University of Virginia, which has a custom front end on their uh, Fedora 3 repository. Uh, and the other is Whitman College, which has an Islandora installation uh, with Fedora 3 as the, the back end. And uh, Islandora does represent the majority of Fedora installations. So it makes a lot of sense to work with uh, an Islandora partner in particular on this project. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Paige to go into some of the details around uh, the metadata decisions at uh, Whitman. Cool, oh, thank you. Um, so last March at Whitman, we formed the Arminda Metadata Working Group that had the goal to assess our fields and clean them up in preparation for our migration to Island Door 8. Um, to, help with our, to help with our migration, our group held weekly meetings talking about the fate of our fields in our repository Arminda. Um, as well as hold discussions about what a cleanup would look like, taking note to document the process as we were asked to join the grant. In our meetings, we utilized Trello to manage our project. We, uh, each field had its own Trello card listed under its IMI field name, and then each Trello card had three attachments. So the first attachment was a spreadsheet that helped us focus on how one field was currently being used across all of our collections. We looked at this field before our meetings to get a full understanding as to what we were working with and to utilize our meeting time. The second attachment was a Google document. During meetings, we would discuss each field, compare them to other institution standards, and then record that decision on this document. Um, we also recorded any cleanup that needed to be done to that specific field here as well. And then the last document was an RDF document. Um, this card was used a little further down the road. Um, once our mapping draft was complete, we would use this card if anybody had any questions about our mapping selections 
um, and seeing if we can have any other mapping. Um, we, if there was an uh, if there was another RDF mapping that fit better, um, this was really to help make the process tr really transparent. So each week we would discuss fields, we would fill them out, um, and then we would move the Trello cards along. And so what this did is that it helped us stay focused on a specific field. It supported open discussion and it provided an area for us to record decisions and our discussions. And so once we held discussions about the changes we wanted done to a specific field, um, then came the actual cleanup and mapping work. And so next I'm gonna share a couple of tools that helped us extract information, stay organized and really make the actual changes. So the first tool that we used was oxygen. Um, our collections were ingested in several different ways into Islandora and oxygen made it possible for us to copy the individual mods out of Islandora and combine them into one document um, while stripping out the while stripping out the values, stripping out the duplicate fields, and really getting a list of all of all what we had in Islandora so that way we could hold rich discussions about them. Um, although we did refer to our fields in the IMI form. Um, in the IMI spreadsheet form name specifically because it was a lot easier to talk about our fields that way as opposed to talking about them in their mods form. So the second and most heavily used tool was Google Sheets. We had 16 topical spreadsheets to prevent information overload as well as to help retain a tight focus on one island or issue. Um, this spreadsheet is a really good example. Here we had all of our field discussions that were found on the Trello card. Um, they were all recorded in this spreadsheet, so that way it was in one area. Uh, we also linked to our meeting notes, so if someone had a question about a field or they wanted to see the discussion we had about that field, they could just go here and link to the meeting notes and read the, read the discussion again. Um, we had a spreadsheet that helped us keep track of which fields from which collections underwent which changes. Um, this was really helpful because we were working across multiple collections at once, and it was important to keep track of those changes um, in each collection. We had a spreadsheet that pulled the headers from each of our 80 sub collection spreadsheets and compare them to one another. Um, this was really helpful when we added, removed, or renamed a field. Um, we would go to this spreadsheet to make sure the changes were done across everything and not just you know one or two. And then lastly, we had a one-stop shop spreadsheet. What this did is that it used equations to pull in from the various topical spreadsheets um, so that information was all in one spot. So if someone had a question about a mapping or if something was repeatable or not, we could just go here as opposed to search the various topical spreadsheets. So while Google Sheets was really good at helping us stay organized, OpenRefine is where we did the actual batch cleanup. Um, we would use OpenRefine clustering and transformation for a lot of the lightweight work. This was specifically helpful when cleaning up dates and consolidating names. Um, it got to the point where I ended up creating a open refined cheat sheet of transformations because as we continued to work on cleaning up our metadata, it became apparent that some of the transit, some of the um, transformations were being used over and over again. So having a cheat sheet really helped that work go fast. Um, but for more of the heavy duty repetitive work in open refine, what I would do is that I would extract the operation history and just apply that formula to other spreadsheets. And a really good example of that is looking at our theses collection. So all I needed to do was insert a, or I need to upload a uh, sub, -collection, sub collection spreadsheet into OpenRefine, make them manually make the changes in OpenRefine. And then um, instead of having to do the same thing with other sub collection spreadsheets, what I could do is just extract the operation history from one, one, from one project in OpenRefine and apply it to the other project. And so it really made the process go really fast. So once our fields were cleaned up, then we could add them into Protege and really work on the mapping. Um, Protege was really helpful specifically when the mapping because um, it really, it cleanly linked our IMI fields to the mods and RDF counterparts. So once the field information was recorded into Protege, I could then go in and switch the viewer from the IMI field name to the mods name. Um, this was specifically helpful when creating the mapping from mods to RDF because I could, uh, you know, it allowed me to focus just on the RDF names. Specifically, in our case, we didn't necessarily care about the IMI field names because it didn't really apply to any of the mapping, but it was nice to have all the same information, um, but looking at the mods view instead. Um, the same thing can be used when you're checking your RDF mapping. So if you switch the viewer from mods to RDF, you can make sure that you didn't duplicate any fields um, so you didn't accidentally merge any fields together. It's a really great way to map everything and check your work. 
And so those are the tools that we use, but of course we had additional resources. Um, the first resource I have to mention is the Islandora Metadata Interest Group. It was Meg's draft mapping that helped us start our own mapping. It was their Slack channel and their meetings that really helped us get a good understanding of what Islandora was um, or Islandora 8 was and what RDF was. Um, the same thing can be said about the Islandora Collaboration Group and their Slack channel. Um, they really helped us stay rooted in our project and answering questions specifically targeted for other small liberal arts colleges. Uh, and it gave us a, an insight as to how to help other people in similar situations as we were. And so we had, with our tools and with our resources, we ended up learning a lot of lessons, um, specifically through our cleanup process. Um, and then the two, the two lessons, though, that I wanted to mention were that it's important to take breaks and it's important um, to work on, to have continual communication. Um, when working on a project to this capacity in this timeline, it's really important to take breaks so that way you can create documentation. Um, you can accurately you can accurately create documentation that really has the same attention to details throughout the entire process. Um, a really good reason why you should take breaks is kind of looking at my typical work week for this process um, for this pro for this um, project. So for for a week for me, um, on the one hand. I would be talking to my coworkers about how, you know, the fate of one field while working on cleaning up another field while mapping a third field. And so with all of that going on at once, it's really important to take breaks between each task because when documenting it, you want to make sure that you don't muddy the waters um, or you don't want to, to muddy down the, the descriptions of what's going on. So you really need to take breaks so that way you really describe what's going on in the documentation. And the second lesson is making sure that you have continual communication throughout the entire process. It's really important um, for us, you know, as working on the grant, we wanted to help create um, documentation that was really clean and clear. And so it was really important for us to communicate throughout the entire process. So that way we documented everything that went on. So that way we could help other people um, once this process is done. And so with that said, I will now hand it back to David. Thanks, Paige. And uh, just to wrap things up here, um, all of this great uh, work is going go to go into the second phase of the grant, which is uh, on validating and improving the, the toolkit that we send out to the community. So we'll be sharing it, uh, getting feedback and uh, iterating as needed to make sure that this is a really useful toolkit for uh, helping the community uh, map their metadata, make uh, remediation decisions, uh, and follow the rest of the process to uh, migrate their repositories. Uh, and then the third phase of the grant, which will run uh, roughly from October to February, uh, our plan is to organize a migration training workshop. The intention is for this to be in person. Right now, that's a challenge, so we may need to push this out to the springtime, but uh, we'll figure that out as we get a little bit closer to, to the fall. Um, but this is intended to be about a two and a half day event, uh, free to attend, uh, with some travel funding provided by the grant for folks that want to attend but can't uh, otherwise afford to uh, to travel and it, just an opportunity to uh, work through some sample data and get some hands-on uh, training for uh, doing these migrations. So all of this work is uh, being made possible by the grant but uh, once the grant funding runs out we still want to be able to make these resources available and keep them up to date and iterate on them over time and that's uh, only possible because Fedora is a community supported open source program uh, that is largely funded by uh, institutional memberships. And these are just all of our members. And I want to say uh, thank you to all these members for supporting us and allowing us to continue to have staff that can work on the project and keep everything going, not just on the software development support side, but also making sure that all of the great things that come out of this grant don't just get lost uh, over time due to uh, not being uh, resourced. And with that, I'll leave a few links here. Uh, if you want to follow along with the grant uh, and the work that we're doing, there's a landing page and some monthly blog posts. Uh, we do have a Slack channel if you want to join the conversation, uh, and you can always support our efforts by uh, becoming a member. So thank you. Uh, here's our contact information. You can reach out to us if you have uh, any questions, uh, and otherwise, thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Paige and David. There are a couple of questions there in the Q&A that uh, I'm sure they will be able to get to. Uh, and we will be moving on to our next presentation. We'll be staying in this virtual meeting room again. Just as a reminder, uh, be sure to transition to the next session in Whova in order to participate in the chat and Q&A there. If you are joining in Whova, you will need to reselect to join in Whova in the next session listing. Uh, again, the session's being recorded and will be available at a later time. 
This next presentation is called Replacing WorldCat with a GitHub repo. Uh, the presenter is Eric Hellman. At the first Code for Lib at OSU, Eric gave a lightning talk demonstrating XSS attacks on a popular OPAC. Hi, my name is Eric Hellman. Uh, I'm run the Free Ebook Foundation. We work to develop technologies that cut across all, all genres of free ebooks, including textbooks, scholarly books, um, computer books. Uh, one of the things I've been doing for the last couple of years is uh, looking at how we might use GitHub and um, I've been sort of doing things that uh, push the limits on GitHub. For example, um, in one project, Gittenberg, uh, we made uh, GitHub repos for every single book, all 60,000 of them on Project Gutenberg. We learned a lot doing that. And as I learn about GitHub, I wonder about other things that we might do with it. And that's what this talk is about. I mentioned WorldCat in the title. The thing about WorldCat is that it used to be big. I mean, 500 million items, that's a lot. I mean, it took hundreds of gigabytes. Billions and billions of holdings. It was huge, but times have changed. Today, storage is smaller and it's cheaper. You can get a one terabyte flash drive for $155, that's pretty good. You can get four terabytes and a portable SSD for under $500. You can get eight terabytes of storage in a MacBook Pro. And if you really wanna go for it all, you can put 144 terabytes on your desktop and it'll be just like a data center on your desk. Well, that's one way of looking at things, but WorldCat is a lot more than storage. And I'm gonna tell you a little secret here. WorldCat is people. <laughs> the thing about WorldCat is it's a collaboration of, of uh, lots of people uh, around the world. Now, this is a poster from uh, a 1973 movie. You may have seen it called Soylent Green. And that, the, this is the poster, and it it's imagines what, what the future will be like in the year 2022. Now, I think, I'm not sure how accurate this vision was, but, you know, the trucks look uh, like the things we have around now. So it can't be that far off, right? So WorldCat, I tried to estimate the number of uh, contributors uh, it's probably like 25,000 or so. Uh, a lot more if you count all of the historic con contributors and all the people who do various, various little things for it. Uh, what brings all these people together is um, having some common expertise in, in metadata and particularly what the kinds of li metadata that libraries use. Um, they, they share an understanding of the workflow involved in cataloging things. Um, they come from all over the world. And um, the reason they do it is because there's a mutual benefit to doing it. Well, so let's, it's, it's 2021. Uh, the question is, we have infinite storage almost. We have, we have internet uh, that, that can do video online. Uh, so, if we were to think about how to do the WorldCat today, how would we do it? One really successful project, building a database with massive collaboration is Wikipedia. You know the philosophy of Wikipedia, everyone can edit. I've edited a couple hundred edits. Uh, I have a son who was over a thousand ed edits before he got into high school. 41 million 
uh, editor accounts. 143,000 of those people are active, um, active editors and contributors. They've even got a thousand admins. So as, as the premier success of, of crowdsourcing and really crowdsourcing a fact, database of facts, um, you might think, okay, why don't we do something like that for a global bibliographic database like WorldCat? Our friend Aaron Swartz um, wanted to do that with Open Library. Uh, but to date, Open Library hasn't replaced WorldCat for the most part. It's useful for some things. Um, and you know, maybe things would have been different if Aaron were still with us. But um, their focus seems now to be on being more of a library than a catalog, um, <clears throat> which I wouldn't argue with that strategy. There are a lot more people who uh, want a library than want to deal with a database. All right, so this talk is about GitHub. The question is, can we use GitHub as a collaboration paradigm for something like WorldCat? Well, they currently are up to 56 million developers account. These developers are, have various expertises. They have a lot of expertise in common. Um, they all understand sort of the basic workflow of, of pull requests and, and forks and things like that. And they come from all over the world. And the reason they work together is to make open source software that benefits everyone. Um, has a lot of differences from the world of uh, building a bibliographic database. They uh, Git provides uh, sort of complete version control in history. Uh, makes it very easy to, to fork and merge uh, uh, lines of code. Uh, it has this wonderful call, feature called Blam, which provides some accountability to the edits that get made. Um, there's, uh, it, and I think most important is the uh, affordances it, it provides for conversation around the changes and uh, ways to, to come to consensus when, when people have different ideas. Uh, so can, can we use GitHub to build databases? Good question. Well, the most successful database, I would say, that's maintained on GitLab is da, 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 free programming books. Ah, let me tell you about free programming books. It started as a list, just a list of books on Stack Overflow in 2008. Um, in 2013, it migrated to GitHub, which made a lot of sense because it's much easier to integrate uh, changes. Uh, since 2017, it's been administered by the Free Ebook Foundation, in other words, me. Um, and um, at the beginning of the, this year, it had 170,000 stars, which was the fourth most of all repos on GitHub. Uh, so that's, that's, that's getting up there. Uh, it's been forked 40,000 times, adding 900 commits from 448 individuals in 2020 alone. And over 1,500 people have contributed to this list of books, which is essentially a database. Uh, I love showing you, showing this. This is a list of the top organizations on GitHub. Look at that number 25, the Free Ebook Foundation. Since January, we beat out Netflix uh, and uh, we've widened our lead over Apple. So you can tell we are a global power in GitHub. Um, so currently it has over 3,700 links to free books. Uh, and includes basic metadata, um, title, author, URL, some access notes. Uh, it's also expanded to free courses. 
and other types of resources. Cheat sheets is our most recent edition. We have lists of books in 35 spoken languages, lists of courses in 20 different languages, and over uh, we cover over 200 different programming languages. In October of this year, uh, as part of Hacktoberfest, which is a sort of a contest uh, sponsored by DigitalOcean, uh, during that month, we received over 1,500 pull requests, and we merged 559 of them from 304 individuals. So we started to get the sort of scale of traffic to, to give us a sense of what it might look like if we tried to scale to something even bigger. A uh, number of things so wonderful about uh, being involved in this project. We get a lot of people who have never ever uh, even contributed a pull request to an open source project. And it's really fun to merge that first ever PR and hope that it's not their last. Um, merging commits from free book authors. People work hard on these books just to give them away, to help others learn to program. It's really cool. Uh, this year, we really expanded our offerings in Bangla, Tamil, and uh, Brazilian Portuguese. Occasionally, we get a perfect PR. I love those. We get thank you notes. <laughs> And there's such a love uh, expressed for learning and for books. So I promised you to, to discuss the, the, the scaling of this. And can it scale to something of the size of WorldCat even? Well, as you might imagine, there are problems. Uh, number one problem, no one needs guidelines. Alphabetization is a big problem. Everyone tries to put their book at, at the end of a list when really we need to alphabetize the list and we do this uh, to facilitate the uh, git dips. Um, not everyone understands that a free book is not the same as a quote unquote shared book. Um, a more fundamental chain difficulty is sort of the non-local or topological change. By non-local, I mean you know, Git works by comparing uh, uh, text locally. So when you have changes that are, for example, moving something from here to there or moving something from here to another file, um, Git doesn't really understand that those are moves rather than, than changes. If you've ever used Git, you will have run into the problem of merge conflicts and um, that turns out to be a really difficult problem because the scaling is bad. Um, the, it's, the merge conflict will will in, rate will increase with the square of the number of commits. Uh, and so we really got in October, we saw a lot of merge conflicts. All right. I, we were discussing WorldCat, weren't we? Well, let's think about some other problems we might have scaling to WorldCat. Well, uh, WorldCat, WordCat does this thing called record loading. Uh, they take other databases and load records into WorldCat. And the process of you know, adding the records or merging with other records is uh, complicated to say the least. Now, the thing is record, lo record loading is inherently non-local and Git is really bad at uh, keeping track of uh, merged streams of merged records and, and, uh, and other things like that. You also have deduping. Uh, deduping can be really hard for Git, um, especially because you, know, you, you have, uh, a graph of the, the various commits that get added in a certain order, and the deduping uh, really messes with the tree, and um, it causes problems. 
Uh, another class of non-local uh, issues with um, a database like WorldCat is uh, the relationships. You have a book that's related to an author and you can put all the metadata in one record or you can have two records, which is what you wanna do for a relational database. Well, Git has trouble representing the uh, relationship. In fact, it doesn't really represent relationships like that. You can stick in identifiers, but still it's kind of, it's not native to Git. These things suggest that if we want to scale uh, to, to, uh, to something larger, uh, we need a different approach, an approach that scales more appropriately. So best I can come up with is that maybe it's a, not a good idea to use Git on all this non-local stuff, like this deduping or the normalization. Points to a different kind of, of process. First of all, you aggregate the raw material. Each of the sources that you're aggregating, you want to version control them, but you don't want to version control the process of normalization or deduping. So you can think of it as, you know, for the same reason, you don't use Git to, to version control um, the, the object code. Once you normalize the source, you can think of uh, deduping and no normalization as the compiling of the database out of lots and lots of records, which might have lots of deduping and de denormalized uh, um, or fields that could be normalized. So I call this the keep all the things approach. Um, and uh, so I made up a neat logo for, for this future database called World Cat, spelled with a K and two Ts, keep all the things. All right, where are we gonna go from here? Well, I've been working on Project Gutenberg, helping them develop their uh, technology. And um, it looks like uh, by the end of this year, uh, all new items on Project Gutenberg will go into GitHub and uh, the metadata for each book on, on Project Gutenberg will be administered partly, at least partly, on GitHub. Well, I think that's pretty cool since I, another project we're using is uh, on Gluit. 90,000 roughly ebooks are uh, cataloged somehow in that. And it's sort of an aggregation of a number of databases, uh, DOAD, Project Gutenberg, Open Textbook Library, and some others. So uh, it looks a lot more structurally like, uh, like WorldCat. So I'm starting to think about ways that we might put all this data into administer it um, via GitHub instead of the way we're doing it, which is sort of we're not doing it. So leave you with this. Keep all the things that are good for you. And feel free to contact me here, read my blog. And now it's time for questions. Wow, Eric, that was fantastic. I have a question. In the list of free programming books, is is there a favorite? Is there one that that bubbles up to the top? Uh, well, we don't we don't keep the books. We just link to the books, and there's no tracking of, ah. of usage, so uh, we don't know. But um, uh, the 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 mo one of the most commented ones is uh, at MIT Press, the structure and and something of, of computer programs, CITP, is that? Anyway, that, that's, that's one of the favorites that's on there. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate that presentation. You may want to jump into the chat. There may be some folks who'd uh, appreciate some comments in there. Um, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much. All right, thanks.
We will be staying in this virtual meeting room again, but please be sure to transition to the next session in Whova to participate in the chat Q&A. If you are joining in Whova, you will need to reselect join in Whova in the next session listing. This session is being recorded and will be available later, as are all of the sessions on the Code for Lib YouTube channel. And our next presentation is Backlog Monster, or the Virtue of Muddling Through, presented by David W. Hodges and Kevin Schlotman. Kevin is Head of Archives Processing at Columbia University Rare Book and Manuscript Library, and David is a Special Collections Analyst at Columbia University Libraries. Hi, I'm Kevin Schlotman, Head of Archives Processing at Columbia University Libraries Rare Book and Manuscript Library. I'm here with my colleague David Hodges, Special Collections Analyst at the Libraries. In this presentation, we take a particular situation in our institution where we made some tools to make a medium-sized project doable and try to draw out some lessons for other work environments. We're hoping to offer ideas for tackling tasks that are looming in the background because they are too big to just do and too small for full project management. Here are some of the familiar reasons to keep something in the backlog basically forever. There are always good reasons not to do something, but at what point do you bite the bullet and tackle the monster? An all too common example in library land is data silos that are connected by the venerable, almost scribal tradition of copying information between systems by hand by using control C and control V. The lift to connect the data silos, especially when there aren't 100% reliable match points, is often too daunting. For better or worse, I see such projects regularly, and I keep an ideas file in my email with dozens of someday we ought to projects. That came in handy in March 2020. To zoom out for a moment, we wondered if there is a generalizable lesson about problematic projects and how organizations handle them. In the familiar dichotomy, Projects are time-bound efforts with a defined goal or end state, whereas operations are characterized by continuity and incremental improvement. Projects receive intense attention and then are mothballed when done. Operations aim for sustainable, low effort over the life of the service. But what if some of the virtues of operations could be brought over to projects and vice versa? And what continuity can be found from project to project? a sort of meta-level program for change. In a chapter of her book on 90s computer culture, the sociologist Sherry Turkle described what she saw as two approaches to the way programmers solve problems, the structured top-down style taught in computer science and the emerging experimental bottom-up tinkering or bricolage style to borrow a concept from anthropology. The value of the latter manifests through accelerated problem solving, discovery of unforeseen paths and pitfalls, and the sort of rapid adaptation that has since become associated with the agile development ethos. Library technology benefits from both styles in the right circumstances. This is a comically crude graph showing manual effort increasing linearly with project size. Applying some automation may help, but in a new project without precedent, conjuring an automated solution out of thin air may be much more trouble than it's worth. If the scope is small, you may do it manually. If large, the effort required is prohibitive. Into the backlog it goes. Subsequent projects, however, can incorporate accumulated knowledge, tools, expertise. The effort slope for automation starts lower. For very small scope, you may still be, be better off doing it manually, but for larger projects, the slopes cross in a favorable area. You've got yourself a project there. In our case, we were able to pick up some tricks and tools from previous efforts, including the large archival migration we discussed in a paper in Code for Lib Journal a few issues back. The Columbia University Library's Rare Book and Manuscript Library stewards over 3,000 archival collections totaling over 70,000 linear feet of material. Nearly 7,000 researchers visit our reading room every year. We sling a lot of boxes, including tens of thousands of boxes off-site at Recap in Princeton, New Jersey. And yet we come out of a manuscript tradition that favors manual, bespoke approaches to, well, everything. 
These two facts coexist uneasily, but over the past six years, we started to use Aon, a request management software, and more recently, Archive Space, archival management software. These, together with the library catalog Voyager, the discovery layer, Clio, and middleware that communicates with Recap, SCSB, or SCSIB, are the systems in which we push data around. Thus, the barcode problem. Offsite container management was built using Voyager Holdings data, which is pushed to SCSI B, but requesting archival material is handled using description from archive space and pushed to Aon. Staff were manually copying and pasting barcodes between the two systems for every single offsite request. In the before times, we never thought we would have time to consider some sort of integration. However, in the COVID era, we had a radical shift in resource allocation. We reached a tipping point. Charged with keeping the RBML staff busy from home with effective work, I cut a JIRA ticket that started with, we are ready to embark on bulk import of recap barcodes into archive space. This will be a big project, but with the current situation, we are well suited to do some of the manual work in a distributed way. As David outlined above, we picked up techniques and tools from previous projects, particularly the migration into archive space. In short, the offsite barcodes were stored in the library catalog in SCSI B, and offsite box requests were flowing from archive space to Aon. To achieve a one time transfer of barcodes into AS, we took an extract transform load, ETL, approach where we pack the T, a mode of work that is staff efficient. Working in Google Sheets, we presented a narrowed interface and centered the expert collection knowledge of archivists. That's not the right box one, it's the other box one from series two. This is a spreadsheet populated with archive space top containers and library catalog or ILS holdings where the barcodes are. We're looking at a joined result based on somewhat fuzzy matching of display strings like box one. In the yellow area on the left are all top containers for a given set of collections with the strings to match. Some collections have hundreds. In the blue middle area is the ILS data that successfully matches on the key. These are the safe ones. Someone just needs to verify that they look okay. The green area is the interactive zone where staff can manually add information. If there is no clear match, a pull down allows them to select which holding record matches the top container. If something is matched manually, new holdings data autofills to the right. This spreadsheet represents the kind of automated manual hybrid workflow that has proven effective in projects like this. Some 70 to 90% of the matching is automated and the remainder is assisted via design features to make it less onerous. Some of the efficiencies gained and lessons learned from prior efforts made this one doable, including Python, Google Sheets, archive space workflows. We've retained and continued to refine practices that got us through this backlog project and hopefully will make future monsters tameable as well. So what are some takeaways from all of this that could be generalized? These are a few we thought of. There's tailoring your project to your team, making use of the particular expertise and, and uh, tools that you've uh, developed from other projects. You can look at automating parts of a large task and not all of it. Um, you can uh, look for a tipping point to push the project from too difficult into the maybe doable area. And a few more while we're at it, aimed perhaps more from the programming standpoint. Um, be realistic, generalize insights, build for reuse with modular programming, cultivate good relations with tools. And there's a lot of great tools out there to assist programmers in, in making better code, and don't be afraid to tinker away with reason. Here's some references we'll pass over, but you can go back and look at them. And we want to thank you all very much for coming to this presentation. Thank you so much, David and Kevin. And thanks to all the presenters in this section. The community support volunteers for the second half of today are Jeremy Friesen on Slack. He's Jeremy Friesen, all one word. And Kate Lynch on Slack. Kate is cat3 underscore drx.
Coming up next after a short break are the breakout sessions. They start at 2.20 Eastern time. Uh, you'll see breakout session listed on the agenda. Click view session. Once in the breakout session, you should see that this session has subsessions and select the breakout that you'd like to attend, view details, and you can select view live stream to join the breakout. There may be limited capacity in the breakout rooms. <laughs> 